Welcome to this second plenary session of this year's pre-presidency conference. Uh, my name is Andrzej Dietrich. I'm director of the Institute of International Relations, and it's my pleasure to welcome you all back to, uh, to the program. We have as a subject of our debate uh, the war, the war between Russia and, and Ukraine, and its broader repercussions for, for European security. Uh, and in my opening remarks, I, I mentioned that uh, what I believe is often missing in political debate is, is clarity and foresight, and that also we are short on one more thing, and that is time. Now, this panel will not give you time, we will take your time, but I, I very much hope that we will be able to give you a little more clarity and, and foresight, not only in terms of what's going to happen uh, at the, the battlefield, but also of the broader repercussions uh, of the conflict for the architecture of European security, but possibly also more broader repercussions that the European Union, including during the Czech presidency in the Council, will need to deal with. For that, we have a great array of speakers, uh, which I will now have the pleasure to introduce to you. On, on my left, uh, we have Christy Reich, uh, director of the Estonian Foreign Policy uh, Institute, and Christine has been kind enough to, to be on two consecutive panels here, so uh, I would like to offer special thanks uh, to her to, uh, to agreeing to sharing her views uh, with us on a variety of topics. Uh, then further to, uh, to her left is Sanam Aydin Duskit, Professor of International Relations at the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Sabanji University and also Research and Academic Affairs Coordinator at Istanbul Policy Center. Then, through Telebridge and uh, online, uh, we will have Oleksiy Melnik, co-director of Razumkov Center uh, in, uh, in Ukraine, Kyiv. And last but not least, uh, at the left uh, end of the table is Roderick Parks, research director of the German Council on Foreign Relations. In the first part of this panel, I, I will ask uh, my, my fellow panelists to, to offer their, their views in terms or in the form of introductory remarks on the key strategic impacts of the war for European security. And uh, let me just check whether we have Alexi with us uh, connected because I would, yes, we do. That's, that's great, at least we can see you, and I hope we will also be able to hear you, because I would very much like to offer the floor, virtual floor, uh, to, you, to you first, so you can share with us your, your perspective uh, on the matter. So please, Alexi, if uh, we, we are connected, the floor is now yours. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Sorry for not being able to attend your nice conference in person for well-known reasons. And, uh, well, uh, trying to answer your question, uh, the answer may be simple. There is a strategic impact of, your, of war on European security. There is an impact in, in the sense of military, security, economic domain, energy, social, and I'm afraid there will be some shockwaves affecting Europe, Europe's policies and European politics because of uh, a huge uh, social impact and that there will be probably constituencies for elections because uh, the European governments will not be able to provide the same level of well-being, I'm afraid. And uh, so what we can see now is probably, again, I'm afraid, it's just the top of an iceberg. And there's more short, short waves are still to come. What is not seen yet, I think, is the impact uh, of war or a longer time crisis on Europe security strategy. Uh, in 2003, the document called European, European Security Strategy, said that Europe 
snail beans so prosperous, so secure, and so free. Uh, in 2022, Europe is facing the most serious security crisis since probably the end of the Cold War. And what has happened between now and then? I think that uh, we all, and Europe as well, missed many warning signs like a Georgian war in 2008 and Crimea annexation in 2014. And now we have to pay the price. And uh, I think that the future of European security will depend on the results of the ongoing war. And currently, uh, it's, it's still uh, the, the, uh, this kind of end state is still a moving target. And uh, there are basically two options. Either, either Russia is allowed to achieve a kind of strategic objective, which will allow Putin's regime to survive and to repeat the same again and again, or we understand the real Russian threat for the European security and do everything to defeat Russia. And as Boris Johnson said uh, that Russia must fail and be seen to fail inside Russia itself. And in this case, we have to be prepared for also another challenge uh, for Russia, Russia's post possible regime change, possible internal disturbances, uh, or even possible uh, Russian disintegration. And all of this will be another great challenge. And that's why Europe has to be prepared both on the level of strategic documents and on the level of its resources. And one of the proposals that we, together with TEPSO, developed for the future Czech presidency is to create a, a at least three months uh, fund to invest in this fund to be better prepared for this and for the future crisis, and not only to support Ukraine, but also for many more challenges to come that we probably don't, don't see or, or don't, can't appreciate now. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> of course, I, uh, I, I'm not speaking on behalf of the Czech government, but I'm, I'm uh, deeply, deeply certain that Ukraine can uh, rest assured of the continuous support of the Czech government during, during the presidency. But perhaps let me, let me follow up with, with a question. You, you, you mentioned uh, the, the prospect of, of Russia defeat. Uh, in, in this war, uh, how do you define Russia's defeat currently? Uh, there, there is quite, quite a clear and reasonable objective or uh, the vision of the Ukrainian victory in this conflict. Because we, our aim is to push Russian forces behind the Ukrainian borders. Uh, at least what they hold before the 24th of February, but uh, preferably uh, Russian has to be push, pushed out of uh, the whole uh, eastern uh, region of Donbass and possibly at least to start political negotiations about the future of Crimea. Uh, however, uh, I think that the, the ultimate goal for all of us should be to eliminate a threat of Rus Russian military threat, not only for Ukraine, but, but for the Europe as a whole. Thank you very much. Let's now follow with um, Christy and the view from Estonia. Thank you very much, Andre. Thanks for Having me on two consecutive uh, panels, um, and this, this topic is really close to my heart. Um, very much agree with the previous Ukrainian speaker that um, the outcome of the war in Ukraine 
will really determine uh, the future shape of uh, European security order. And I will try to share some reflections, um, in my view, what can be said at this point uh, about the new order that might emerge. Um, but to begin with, uh, let me stress that Ukraine is actually defending the possibility to have a rules-based security order in Europe, and it's fighting against Russia's efforts to redefine the European security order on Russia's terms, uh, efforts to re-establish uh, spheres of influence defined by force, uh, fighting efforts to, to kind of uh, uh, reject uh, full sovereignty to Russia's European neighbours. So uh, in Estonia, we really have a very strong sense that Ukraine is fighting also for our security and not only for, for Ukraine. So we are in a major turning point. Uh, the previous one was uh, just over 30 years ago. Um, that, from my experience, it was a time that uh, brought back freedom to large parts of Central and Eastern Europe. And, and I remember the time of you know, the late 1980s and the 1990s uh, as time of great optimism and idealism and kind of uh, rebuilding our own independent uh, state in the, in the Baltic states, reintegrating with the Western uh, structures. But it's also important to remember that for Russia, the experience was different. Russians don't remember the 1990s as a time of idealism and optimism and kind of great advances. They rather remember it as a time of uh, misery and chaos and decline. Uh, the democratization process in Russia never really got very far. And uh, also an important thing to remember is that even in the 1990s, Russia was never kind of fully satisfied with the post-Cold War security order that emerged back then. And, and uh, as time went on, when Putin came to power in 2000, it became gradually more and more evident what was it that Russia was unhappy about. Uh, most importantly, this principle in the European security order that every country has the right to choose its own orientation. And secondly, also the emphasis on, on uh, democracy and human rights and the kind of uh, democratic values as Russia started to move more and more towards authoritarianism, authoritarianism since 2000, it became more and more unhappy with the emphasis that was placed on, on these uh, European uh, values. And, and so here we are today with the post-Cold War uh, security order broken and partly because the West uh, did not uh, take Russia's grievances seriously enough. And what I mean by not taking seriously is it did not put clear limits to Russia's ambitions to re-establish a sphere of influence. It, it allowed Russia to kind of take steps towards its uh, goals without really kind of stopping it uh, at a time when it would have been easier. But now uh, to look to the future, uh, I have kind of five points uh, what, to, what to expect from the uh, security order in Europe in the coming years. And first of all, I think we have to acknowledge that we cannot have a shared understanding on European security order with Putin's Russia. What will come after Putin is, is unpredictable and hopefully at some point, you know, we will, the time will come when we can again kind of negotiate with Russia on a new security order where we have a shared, uh, shared understanding. But I think now it's best to acknowledge that it, it's not possible with the current regime in Russia. It's better to treat Russia as an adversary and, and to focus on defending our Western structures. And so my second point is uh, a kind of more positive aspect of this uh, rather gloomy story that the Western parts of the European security architecture are actually stronger today than uh, they were just a few months ago. Uh, both the EU and NATO have uh, really shown a surprising degree of unity and resolve in response to the war in, in Ukraine. 
So uh, we have uh, the existing Western structures strengthening and consolidating and, and uh, showing a kind of new sense of uh, purpose. This is the moment uh, to show that we are serious about defending European values and de defending the kind of core principles of European security order. Now, my third point is that uh, we see kind of grey zones in Europe diminishing and, and uh, uh, to be eliminated as far as possible because grey zones have proved to be unstable. And, and whereas there was this thinking um, in the post-Cold War era that uh, many Western European countries thought it's good to show restraint uh, in engaging in, in areas kind of uh, that uh, Russia called its near abroad. Uh, it was uh, thought it was good for European stability not to have too much Western military presence close to uh, Russia's borders and it was good not to go too far with you know, integrating uh, countries uh, in the east uh, to, to the uh, European structures. Uh, Ukraine has not received, uh, for example, the membership perspective in the EU thus far. One important reason is that there was a wish not to provoke Russia. I mean, we have to be honest, this was a, like one of the main, main reasons. But now it's, it's a moment to, to um, admit that uh, this is not a way to increase uh, stability, to, to have this kind of uh, geopolitically prudent uh, approach and, and show restraints. Um, Russia has been behaving aggressively where it has seen weakness next to its borders and where it has seen opportunities to expand its uh, sphere of influence. But it has not been advancing where it has uh, seen Western uh, resolve and strength for example, uh, or especially uh, when it comes to, to NATO. So it's, it's uh, what this means now for, for uh, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, we need to have strategic clarity, a clear strategic goal that one day these countries will become members of the EU. And this is also a clear message to, to Russia that, uh, that uh, Europe is defending their right to choose their, their orientation. Uh, then my fourth point is that we have a hard border emerging again between Russia and Europe, um, which means increased military presence on both sides of the border. It means uh, very much restricted interaction, be it people to people or economic inter interaction across the border. And it means um, um, a strong kind of cleavage between the political systems, democracy and freedom in Europe versus today we have to speak about totalitarianism, not just authoritarianism in Russia. And this is also a major source of uh, tensions. And then my final point, I will finish with that. Um, what uh, the war in Ukraine has also shown, uh, this is not really news, but it has reinforced the understanding that um, the U.S. plays an indispensable role in European security. And, and uh, it's very important that Europe is now finally starting to be serious about doing more for its own security and defense. But at the same time, um, especially for countries that are, say, close to Russia, um, we have really now... Um, got further confirmation that uh, it's in our interest to keep the U.S. commitment to European security as strong as possible and, and uh, at the same time strengthening Europe's own capabilities, but uh, not in order to take uh, distance from the U.S. because uh, we have seen um, how, how this uh, contribution has been absolutely necessary during the current uh, conflict. I will stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for that. You know, I, I would like to pick on two things that you mentioned. First, uh, 
you said that we didn't take Russia seriously. And the way I, I read it, it, it's not like sometimes it is put that, you know, we should have appeased Russia, sort of walk, walk Russia through its post-imperial syndrome and be a little bit more empathic, empathetic. Uh, but if I got your meaning right, you know, what you, what you meant was that, you know, we should, we should be more forthcoming, you know, in facing <coughs> Russia's tolerance, uh, warfare. Uh, could you expand on that, you know, provided that we're doing something of an autopsy here, you know, of European security, security order, what could have NATO or the West done <coughs> differently? And is there a lesson that we can draw for, for the future? And then you, you mentioned the issue of order, which I think is very crucial. I'd also like other speakers to, to, to speak on that. But <clears throat> let me ask if, if you believe that it's possible in principle to have some sort of a security order, even in a regional security system, when the relations are anemic to a large extent, when we are not just all friends, you know, when we are adversaries, actually. Can we have something of a security security order still? Because that may be something that you know we are in for for quite some time, possibly. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes, excellent uh, questions. Uh, first, on the past mistakes, uh, this has been discussed a lot, of course, over the past uh, months, and and uh, there have been lots of. Uh, uh, references made to, to Georgia in 2008 and Crimea in 2014. Of course, these were the key moments uh, when uh, the response could have been much stronger, especially 2008. It was the first time where Russia actually used, clearly used military force against a neighboring country. And, and the EU was involved in uh, mediating uh, a deal that... Uh, a ceasefire agreement uh, that uh, ended uh, the war. And yet when the Russian side did not respect that agreement, there were no consequences whatsoever. The Western focus was on reset and then trying to find a more positive uh, track and more cooperation and more dialogue with Russia. There was not even you know, a discussion about whether there should be sanctions or some other form of uh, reaction to show that we do not actually a proof of the way Russia was uh, behaving. And uh, one might also refer to the NATO Bucharest summit, which uh, gave this halfway answer to, to, um, uh, to Ukraine's uh, membership perspective, uh, which was the worst possible outcome to, to suggest that Ukraine may become member, but actually the decision showed that NATO was not really committed to, to uh, having Ukraine as a member. So it really exposed Ukraine, made it vulnerable to, to uh, Russia's uh, imperial ambitions. But then the second question uh, on, on, yes, whether we can have uh, a security order that includes adversaries. And that's, of course, a huge question. And we kind of had that during the Cold War. Right, so, so um, if we draw parallels between what is ahead of us and uh, what we had during the Cold War, there are many similarities. And, and uh, one of them is indeed that you can still have some kind of uh, agreement on certain security principles. Um, while you treat the other side that is part of that agreement as an adversary. But I, I also want to add here that we have to be very honest that even during the Cold War, there was not really a kind of full agreement between the Soviet Union and Western countries about the European security order. I mean, come on, Soviet Union was occupying large parts of Central and Eastern Europe. So you had all these principles uh, of, of the UN Charter and then later 75, uh, the OSCE, or at that time the Conference uh, for Security uh, and uh, CSCE, Conference for Security and Cooperation in Europe, right? Uh, but it's not that the Soviet Union was kind of fully subscribing or fully respecting these principles, but they were there. And they maybe help to, to create some stability and a framework to, to, you know, 
to have a dialogue. So in that sense, yes, we might be facing uh, something similar. Thank you for that. And let's now move to, to Sanam. What's your take? Thank you very much. I will try and make three main comments about what might we expect in the security order to happen. Now, I'm going to say a few words about the European Union and then about NATO and also a few words about uh, regarding in particular energy security and food security, I think which are also related uh, to this broader notion of security that we're talking about also in the context of this war. Now, um, about the EU, I mean, much has been said in the first panel about, you know, the potential future membership of countries like Ukraine, uh, Moldova, Georgia, uh, quite a few things have been said about the prospect of differentiated integration and its future, uh, since full membership in at least the foreseeable future seems rather unrealistic, as some people have said already. Uh, so bringing forth debates about the potential shape of this external differentiation. Now, I think something um, I'd like to say in addition or on top of these comments that have already been made, because I think it matters how the EU will respond to these. Um, and also, I think it, this will also um, impact the EU's flexibility and its ability uh, to retain some degree of, of power or leverage uh, over these countries, is that whether this, the future of external differentiation will be or will come in a shape and form that is inclusive and that does not go mutually in, in a mutually exclusive uh, fashion with full membership. I think this is critical here. And as somebody, I think Petr said at the beginning, that we're here talking about two different types of countries. I mean, it's rather easier, relatively easier, let's say relatively there, because we know with, with Britain, of course, there are all sorts of problems still, um, to achieve a working form of external differentiation since these countries already meet certain standards and, and some of them have already been, like Britain, a part of the policy making when the policies were actually being made. Now, with countries like Ukraine after the war, like Moldova, Georgia, or even Turkey, if one day it decides to return back to democracy, um, there is a question of you know, not meeting those standards. And, and not just in terms of democracy rule of law, but I'm referring at large to governance standards as well. So the question will be whether you're going to give the option of either in or out and leave these countries you know, lose them along the way, like Turkey had been lost after 2005 and six and seven, or find somewhere in the middle where you don't negate the option of membership, but you include them. And what do I mean by inclusive, differentiated or incremental membership is, you know, of course, here we'd have to open up the taboo subject of treaty change, maybe. But since it's already been mentioned by Macron in his Europe Day speech, I think we can break the taboo and talk about it here as well. And, it, you know, give them some kind of voice in institutions or policies on which they're going to be a part of. Um, so, of course, this would require a lot of creative thinking, innovation, and it would not be easy to reach a political agreement, but I think this would be the necessary way um, to go. So this is the first thing I wanted to say. Now, of course, speaking about Europe, Christy mentioned something very important. She brought up the subject of the United States. And I'm quite surprised that we haven't discussed the United States so far uh, at this length, um, since I think um, a key issue that we'd have to watch out for for this emerging new, because I do agree that we are now entering a, a new era. I think we're witnessing the end of an era, and we're at a new era where we're reconstructing and rebuilding European security architecture, um, where the role of US will be critical. Now, of course, to dig deep into that, we need to look into domestic politics in the United States. And there, of course, we see that the situation is rather delicate, right? We're dealing, we're talking about an extremely polarized country. We are talking about a country where about one half of the population uh, wants to see a more inward looking, a more protectionist United States. And we're looking at a Republican party that has a serious chance of winning the next elections and a party which has been transformed substantially in the image of the former president Donald Trump. 
So what will the European Union do in case that happens? And that is a serious possibility, I think, that the Europeans would have to think about. And I don't think we can be 100% confident that the US, as the whole state apparatus, will retain this sustained commitment to European security. It might, but then again, it might not, since there is a public uh, opposition there to some extent as well. So of course this brings us to the debates about internal differentiation again. Uh, this time not external but more internal about uh, the possibility of a more autonomous security and defense capacity. We know it's been mentioned in the first panel uh, that defense spending has obviously increased in Europe and that's a good thing seeing some member states uh, you know boosting up their uh, commitments to NATO defense expenditures etc. But of course the big question is you know, what happens if, if, if US doesn't commit? What happens if Europe does not have that autonomous capacity of security and defense? Uh, and whether defense spending in NATO would be enough or whether something more institutional and structural would be necessary. And that brings me, of course, to the subject of NATO. Now, I've been asked to say a few things about the current Turkish position in NATO. Uh, by a number of my colleagues, so uh, since coming from Istanbul, I'm burdened to say a few things about that maybe. So let's keep it short. Um, well, I mean, I'm sure that all of you, or at least most of you know, that Turkey currently now is blocking um, the Swedish and Finnish applications for um, NATO membership. So again, you know, we're in a new era in the sense that we are contemplating the Swedish and Finnish uh, membership, and this also shows the extent to which things are changing. Um, but Christy and, and you have also said that what happens in a security architecture when you're dealing with adversaries or partners, and of course maybe you were referring to Russia, but one can also think of Turkey or Hungary, you know, other countries that might have a different views about how that security architecture should look like. And I think this is an important point. Uh, now, with regard to this specific crisis, I think it will be resolved. My personal hunch is that an agreement will be reached because I don't think Turkey has the luxury to, uh, or have the option, in my view, to remain outside this emerging Western security architecture since it also fears the risk and a potential threat from Russia as well. So it's been trying to sort of tread this balance between Russia and the EU, especially now that we're approaching elections as well. The government doesn't want to, uh, or it cannot afford a complete fallout uh, with Russia. Um, I think that's something to keep in mind. Uh, and perhaps a silver lining that we can take from all this tragedy is that, you know, we shouldn't forget that before the war, Turkey was getting closer and closer to Russia day by day. So it was almost about to fall into the Russian orbit regarding the energy dependence, regarding the economic links and everything. And with the war, we see that that tilting, that asymmetry has kind of, has found a balance again. And I think this is an important point to see how, um, you know, certain potential adversaries or countries that might have difficult viewpoints have kind of changed a position here as well. But I think we also should not underestimate, and this is not something just for Turkey, but the global south in general, how views on this war can be different than the average point of view on, in, in Europe. So as academics, we talk about decentering European foreign policy these days, trying to look at Europe from an external viewpoint as well. And in countries like Turkey, like in Brazil, like India or elsewhere, there's a lot of public debate about you know, whether the Russians were in fact provoked by the West and, you know, whether the Russians have some justification whatsoever. You know, I'm not saying that this is justified or not. I'm just saying that these views, uh, it, it should not be taken for granted that these publics sort of give their full support uh, to the European or Western position and that there is a um, public dynamic there as well that can go e either way. And this doesn't stem from Euroscepticism. At least in the Turkish case, I can say that it has everything to do with anti-Americanism, which spiked after the Iraq war. And that has to be understood. And that is why we should also contemplate the prospect of Europe perhaps, you know, uh, being a, becoming more autonomous in this field as well. And finally, um, two points about different aspects of security, energy security mentioned in the first panel, and also food security that we haven't talked about. And how these two issues, in my opinion, relate to notions of resilience and solidarity. 
because I think resilience will be key here. The longer this war continues, the more difficult I think it will be in Europe to retain solidarity with spiking energy prices in the coming winter and with a food crisis that we're approaching and with rising food prices. Since Europe is made up of democracies, with the exception of Hungary, of course, and to some extent Poland, uh, we are uh, risking a, a, a problem of, of, of solidarity and it would it might be difficult to retain this resilience. Uh, whereas here, of course, the Russians would be re more resilient given that they are an autocracy and, and, and plus that uh, they are of course, also, of course, being sanctioned is another uh, question. But of course, here, time, I think, will be of the essence. So I'll finish there. <laughs>
German politics was, was quite polarized. You don't really see it from the outside very often because it's, it's, of course, a more, more a sort of consensus-based system um, than, for example, the UK, but there were heavy divisions. Um, Chancellor Schultz came to power basically um, uh, promising to be the heir to Merkel um, and to guide foreign policy um, as she had done. Um, but the two junior coalition partners, the FDP and the Greens, were the ones that really made the running during the coalition talks. Um, so they said they would choose um, either between SPD and, and CDU, and they were uh, contesting, um, in particular, Schultz's his right to, to sort of steer foreign policy. Um, on top of that, you have heavy splits between the parliament and the executive in, German at the mo in Germany at the moment because of 10, 15 years of very executive-heavy um, crisis management, which alienated the parliament. Um, and uh, neither the parliament nor the government can really read public opinion at the moment, which seems to be ahead of um, the government when it comes to, to Russia rather more hawkish. But nobody can tell whether that's based on fear or conviction. Um, and if it's based on fear, what happens if there's an escalation, or actually what happens if it ends in Russian debacle and Germans go back into complacency? Um, so that's the second thing, these sort of heavy internal divisions. And the third things are, and this is really what I'll focus on, um, uh, international divisions, that Germany is being pulled in different directions by the US, by France, by the UK, um, um, by the Central Europeans, and really needs to find its, its own way through. Um, and my prediction, I think, is that there won't be a big turnaround in strategy, not a clear turnaround in strategy. But what I think you will see is Germany revisiting some of the tenets and, and buzzwords in its previous security approach and rethinking them, sharpening it, and, and uh, learning to push back against some of its partners. Um, and I'll just go through three of those. And Andre, tell me to, to shut up at any stage if I go on too long. Um, the, the first is, is this famous phrase, Vandal durch Handel, so this idea that um, by trading um, with other countries, you can shape them politically. Um, that, that was one of the first victims of uh, the Russian uh, invasion. Um, uh, and the, the uh, Schultz speech was really declaring that dead. Um, and the sense was that, that Germany had allowed itself to become economically dependent on Russia and now couldn't act against it. Um, that's now changed. Um, and funnily enough, I think what we're seeing is, is Germany doubling down on Handel, Deutsch, Vandal. So what you increasingly hear is that um, we didn't become dependent on Russia because we were trading with it. We were basically making trash ca cash transfers um, to uh, a, an autocratic rent-seeking um, Russia. Um, Handel, uh, Vandal, Deutsch, Handel um, happened in China. That's where trade really changed the regime, um, but that's where it went wrong. So instead of giving up on um, Vandal durch Handel, we have to get better at it. Um, so I think this is the first thing that Germany is really going to start looking at. How can it leverage its economic and its trade links um, more? Um, and uh, the first point of departure there, I think, is how do we diversify our, our, our economy and our sources of supply? Um, uh, and on that basis, how do we offer new alliances and partnerships? Um, secondly, uh, where can we offer um, to other bits of the world um, an idea of mutual autonomy, that by both of us diversifying our links, increasingly away from China, um, where can we both gain uh, autonomy in uh, a hostile uh, geopolitical environment? And that's particularly geared towards the global south. Um, and thirdly, how do we do business with China? Um, and that means uh, trying to work out um, how to control choke points um, and how to develop indispensable technologies that the Chinese need um, and that we can then leverage. Um, take that as you will. So um, although um, Vandal Deutsch Handel was declared dead, I think it's back again, and the Germans are working out how to make it work. Um, secondly, European autonomy. Again, an early victim in Germany um, of um, the invasion. Um, uh, and. Uh, I think the mood music in Berlin shortly after the invasion was, look how dependent we in fact are on the US. The idea of European autonomy is, is a no-goer. Um, and look how the French are leveraging the idea of European autonomy um, to make essentially French deals um, with the Russians. Um, we need to think of something else. Um, again, I think there's been a, a sort of 360 degree, degree turn there in, in Berlin, and they're trying to double down at the moment on the idea of, of European autonomy and to actually make it work. Um, on the one hand, 
um, to, to do some of the things that, that Senem talked about. So to, you know, by building up European autonomy, you hedge a little bit against um, uh, Trumpism. You give the US a, a reason to, to stay in um, Europe and uh, you push back against um, the US making sort of hub and spokes bilateral agreements with individual European states. Um, but secondly, it's also a way to push back against the French themselves um, to make sure that European foreign and security policy is more than just scaled up French geo strategy. Um, so I think if, if the Germans are, are trying to reinvent um, European autonomy for themselves, it's on that basis. Where is that happening? You might think it was, it was primarily happening in Ukraine, um, but that's not the case. That's not where Germany feels that it needs to um, keep the US involved or push back against the French. Um, uh, primarily, I think it's happening in the Western Balkans. Um, uh, that's where expectations of German ac uh, action are highest and fears in Berlin that France is alienating the Western Balkans are also high. Um, so having an autonomous European policy towards the Western Balkans is, I think, um, prime priority. Secondly, funnily enough, it's in North Africa and in West Africa. Um, so the debate at the moment is on the Mali mission um, uh, and the French having been kindly invited to, to leave. Um, the debate in Berlin is, um, can European autonomy in that part of the world be more than just French geostrategy? strategy? Um, can we make an autonomous choice to remain in the region um, and impress the US? Um, and then thirdly, I think on that basis, they're thinking about what does European autonomy look like towards Ukraine? Um, you can only make an offer of candidacy towards Ukraine if you've satisfied yourself that you're not going to alienate the Western Balkans um, and that you are capable of um, taking positions um, that are as sharp as the French would like but are not French. Um, so I think, funnily enough, Ukraine comes third in the list of, of places where, where Germany is looking to, to boost European autonomy. Um, thirdly, and I'll stop with this, um, the rules-based international order. Um, again, the Germans declared it dead on February 25th um, when, when the Russians um, renewed their invasion um, of Ukraine, and there was a sense that the British and the Central Europeans had got it right, um, that the rules didn't count for much, um, that what mattered was geopolitical action, and here were the British in particular getting it right on refugees, to a degree, more Central Europe, but sanctions and sending arms to, um, to the Ukrainians. Um, since then, I think, again, the Germans have, have switched back and they're trying to double down on the idea of a rules-based international order primarily in Europe itself, and primarily geared towards getting the British and the Central Europeans back in line. Um, so the first thing they're doing, I think, or will do, and this is a bit speculative, but I think you hear increasingly complaints in Berlin about the British and so-called negative security competition. So the idea that the British are making deals with the Central Europeans, the Finns and the Swedes, and they're making the Germans look bad, and they're undercutting um, the European security order, so they were pushed back against the British um, by trying to get them back into CSTP structures. Um, secondly, pushing back a little bit at Hungary and perhaps even Poland um, when it comes to rule of law. Um, and you hear increasingly in Berlin that um, uh, we shouldn't see, um, we, we shouldn't be putting, well, there shouldn't be a trade off between geopolitical unity and rule of law, and that we should make compromises there much more. Um, the rule of law is central to European security and unity, so we should really be cracking down on um, breaches of rule of law um, in Poland and uh, Hungary. Um, and uh, thirdly, I think you are seeing the beginnings um, of new institution building in Berlin that says, um, uh, we have sympathy with frontline member states like Poland, but we will build confidence building structures over their heads um, and make compromises over their heads. That's rather speculative. Um, but I think in terms of a sort of rules-based order, the sense is rather than being pulled into a conflict with frontline member states, you would rather build um, sustainable um, institutions that perhaps go over their heads towards Ukraine and perhaps even to, towards Russia. Um, I'll stop with that. Um, it can go, I think, one of two ways. Um, either you have a Germany that rethinks its strategic position on the basis of its comfort zones um, and, and familiar approaches and becomes 
a more reliable and solid partner, um, or one that's a little bit too much within its comfort zones, um, remains piecemeal, contradictory, and unreliable. Um, and I'm not sure which way it's going to go. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for breaking this down. And before we open this to, <laughs> to the public and you, you leave us, so let me ask uh, other members of the panel uh, whether you wish to respond to anything that's been said by anyone, anyone else. If not, immediately. Yes, you do. Excellent. So let's go ahead. Thanks. I, I tried to be brief, but there are so many big questions uh, raised. Um, first, on, on European autonomy. Um, I have paid attention that uh, President Macron has not actually used the concept of strategic autonomy for, for quite some time anymore because it has proved so controversial. And uh, it was always problematic. What we need is European capabilities strengthened. And that will then pave the way for Europe uh, in future to be able to take more responsibility for its uh, security. But uh, right now, to discuss whether we need some new structures uh, for European defence. This is a non-starter because there are many member states uh, that uh, absolutely don't agree with this idea. And uh, Finland and Sweden are just uh, now on the way to NATO membership. Finland has been one of the strongest proponents of EU defence. But by applying for NATO membership, it is acknowledging that the EU does not provide comparable security guarantees. It needs NATO membership in the current security environment in order to, to feel uh, secure enough. And, and uh, Finnish and Swedish NATO accession, I think, will make this division of labor between the EU and NATO even more clear. That the EU, for the time being, it's not taking over the responsibility of NATO for collective defense. But the EU can contribute in its own ways uh, to European security and defense. That's, that's my, my perspective. Then a uh, second issue I wanted to raise briefly is this rules-based order again. Is it dead? I, I don't agree with this claim that it is dead. It's broken. It's broken by Russia. But the whole war in Ukraine is about defending the rules-based order. And the principles are still there in the UN Charter and in the OSCE documents, which Russia is violating. And we are condemning the violations and we are fighting Russia because we don't accept the violations. And, and if Russia will gain or win something as a result of this war of aggression, then maybe we come to the point where we have to admit that rules-based order is dead. We are back to spheres of influence. But now the fight is, is, is ongoing actually about this very issue. Thank you. Um... Let's open this up. Uh, Jakob, please, go ahead. Mm, thank you, Jakob Hagen. I'm director of the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. So first of all, thanks to uh, an extremely exciting panel. But before that, I'd really like to also to, to thank the Czech Institute and TEPSA for this wonderful conference. And I'm saying that uh, mindful of that we are actually organizing this in, in December. So I'll take this opportunity to welcome you all. And Ilva, my colleague, will talk more about that uh, tomorrow. So uh, a comment apropos Kirsti's uh, uh, pertinent points about gray zones and, and Swedish and Finnish accession to, to NATO and then a question about uh, Turkey's motivation. So uh, I think uh, the key driver in the Swedish and the Finnish uh, decision to apply for membership after quite a long time of neutrality and non-alignment, in Sweden's case more than 200 years, is that since uh, Russia sent around their list of demands in December and then showed in no uncertain terms in Ukraine that they were meaning uh, business in a very unfortunate way, is that before Russia probably accepted and wished for Sweden and Finland to be non-aligned, but after that they wanted us to be non-aligned, and that was clearly one of the, of the tipping points. And apropos Kisti's comment, yes, I mean, we've had a brief but 
quite thorough discussion about the pros and cons of, of security provided through the European Union and through NATO, and it's become abundantly clear that the collective security guarantees only exist in, in NATO, uh, and that uh, yeah, the, the structures provided within the European Union is simply uh, not enough for that, at least for, for now. So those are, the, I think, the main uh, drivers and reasons for that. So my question to, to Semen, uh, thank you for uh, mentioning that you think that this crisis will be solved, which is, of course, of keen interest for, for Sweden and, and Finland as applicants, but I think for all the whole alliance. But could you maybe just develop a little bit why you think that Turkey uh, did want to take this fight now? Is it mainly domestic or alliance-related uh, reasons? So that would be very interesting to hear. Thank you so much, André. Sure, and, and thanks for sharing <coughs> the, the Swedish perspective here as well and bringing it into discussion. So, Sanam, would you like to yeah, sure. respond, please? Yeah, thank you for the question. Well, um, okay, there are a few, there are a number of reasons that might be behind this, but I will have to speculate a bit, as we know that Turkish foreign policy making these days is extremely centralized in the office of the president, which is why you might be hearing one thing from some one person, and then, you know, two weeks later, the president comes out of Friday prayer and says something completely else, right? So that kind of leaves us puzzled as well. But let me just at least outline what might be behind this. Now, first of all, Turkey's grievances with um, some NATO uh, partners, um, uh, also with Sweden, um, but also with the United States over the Kurdish issue. In particular, uh, their support to PYD in northern Iraq. Uh, and so Turkey has been saying, you know, over and over again over the years that, you know, some NATO member states harbor the PKK. For those who don't know the PKK, it's the, uh, the Kurdish uh, uh, militia terrorist organization, that basically that this is a terrorist organization, so it should not be harbored and et cetera, et cetera. So the, so the PKK and the Kurds is one part of the story. Now, of course, there is a domestic side of the story as well, because the AKP is in a coalition with the ultra-nationalist MHP, it's got the elections coming up next year, and it's playing into the hardcore sort of nationalist, Turkish nationalist and anti-Kurdish position. And it's criminalizing the whole Kurdish issue and the Kurdish movement, and I even expect the Kurdish party to close down, uh, hopefully not, but probably it will be, before the elections, right? So there's a domestic side of the debate as well. Uh, about the US, let's unpack the grievance with the US a little bit, because this is a bit different, or it has other dimensions than the ones that it has with some NATO member states, and that is that Turkey had been pushing to be included in the um, F-16 and even the F-35 program. Um, and it was also very unhappy with some of the uh, defense embargoes uh, by Canada, not just the US, but Canada, and even the United States. So I think it was quite telling when Boris Johnson declared a few days ago that they're going to lift the defense export ban to Turkey. And that there are, and we've been hearing news that Canada is also in the line. So this might be sort of the US-driven way of saying, okay, we're gonna do something about this, so let's come and agree. So that's why I think that an agreement might be in the picture. So, um, yeah, and finally, and this would be my speculation, the other ones perhaps might be a more realistic, but he might also be wanting to give a message to Russia. I don't know, this is, might be an indirect way of saying, look, I mean, we're sort of, you know, striking to the balance, we're not always, you know, on one-to-one -one terms with the other NATO members, so we can still work with you or deal with you to some extent. So that might be uh, perhaps, you know, uh, one bird, uh, stone killing two or three birds at the same time. So that would be my answer. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I couldn't say it's this or that. It's these in a compilation, right? Because, and that is the reason also that we cannot tell when Turkey will be satisfied because the list is mixed and it's got all these things in the bag. Yeah. Because it rarely is this on that, right? <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks for breaking this down. I'm registering two, two questions. Uh, so I would ask the gentleman over there, then, then, then here, 
and then here, and let's collect the, the three questions and then return to the panel. So please just, if you can identify yourself. Yes, thank you, Jim Klaus, uh, TAPSA General Secretary. Uh, I, I, I have two or three remarks. First, I'd like to, to, to thank uh, Mr. Melnik for a very clear statement, also on the question of what uh, uh, defeat of Russia means. I, I noticed uh, what he said. It was very interesting. Uh, I, uh, I must say that uh, I like very much what Mrs. Aydin Duzgit said about the USA, because as it is entirely clear that in the present circumstance you have to stand with the United States very strongly and firmly. But I think you are absolutely right to also think in the longer term perspective because of what you said about the United States. And this brings me to European uh, strengthening our defense. Of course, it is not even for the French. There is a question of the EU replacing NATO. Let's be very clear about this. Uh, and that is why the Finns uh, have decided to go into NATO is, of course, a, a question of pure realism. The Finns, in my view, will continue to push for European, a much stronger European involvement in defense, including within NATO. Uh, thing. So I think that's not an antonymy. Uh, um, as far as uh, Roderick is concerned, the, the, the German questions are fascinating. I just have a very small point. Did I hear you right saying that the UK is exemplary in terms of treating Ukrainian refugees? Because I can give you a ah, Central Europe. Because I heard you saying the UK because that's completely wrong. I, yeah, OK. I have a question to Christy. Uh, Christy, you say at some stage, uh, I, I just, it's a real question. You said no restraint vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia in terms of we should not let gray zones uh, subsist. Does that mean that we should uh, go to the end as far as uh, Crimea is concerned, Transnistria and the problem in Georgia, that we should actively uh, try and change the situation there? Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And let's, well, let's collect the other question. Yeah, Frank Schimmelfennig, ETH Zurich, and also member of the TEPSA board. Uh, actually, my, follow, uh, my, my question follows up immediately on uh, uh, Jim's, and it's also to Christy. Uh, after everything we've heard, we've, we've heard about, let's say, the uh, uh, danger of gray zones, the indispensability of the United States, what does it mean for the... Um, enlargement of the European Union uh, to the three countries that have uh, recently applied. I mean, um, often EU membership, and uh, that has also been part of the initial negotiations between U Ukraine and Russia, is portrayed as uh, some kind of a substitute of NATO membership. Um, what we're hearing now is that this doesn't really work. I mean, is it a realistic perspective uh, for EU enlargement to do that without the NATO membership of these countries, having in view that, that this would uh, still create, uh, say, gray security zones and that uh, the European Union does not have the capacity to defend these countries when push comes to shove, and that um, this will then still provoke Russia, if it then still has the capability to do anything about it, um, to... Um, intervene in these uh, countries while the uh, process is going, going on. So, I mean, it, it, would it be a, now that, let's say, uh, Russia cannot actually be provoked anymore by NATO membership, shouldn't, shouldn't this go hand in hand? Because I think that was also a part of the, su of the success of the earlier Eastern enlargement, that NATO and EU enlargement actually went hand in hand for uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Yes, uh, my name is uh, Paul Schmidt from the Austrian Society for European Politics. I would like to ask two questions. My first one would go to Christy as well. <laughs> Christy, um, the European Union tries to help Ukraine. We have economic sanctions. We are working on the sixth wave, which, which all it, with all its uh, complications. And um, resilience is very important, uh, and the time is of the essence, we know that. And then there's military help, financing of military equipment and humanitarian engagement. And my question to you would be also against, um, uh, also keeping in mind that the French and Germans um, try to, to stay in touch with the Kremlin and uh, others 
Um, for example, the Estonian Prime Minister would argue differently and say, well, there's no need uh, to talk at the moment. We need complete isolation. And if also, if you listen to Timothy Snyder, for example, he would argue um, the least we have to do now is look for a face-saving exercise for the Russians, because if they want to save their face, they invent them a face-saving exercise themselves anyway. So my question is, with all this taking place, do you actually see room for diplomacy there? Where is diplomacy in all this? Um, and my second question would go to Senem. I wanted to ask you, um, as an observer, um, I'm, I'm very interested to see the different developments that Turkey is taking. Um, you have referred to um, the balance of interest, so to speak, between the different blocks and the different uh, geographical players, and the search for this balance, basically. Where do you see Turkey uh, after the elections, keeping in mind the... the a difficult economic situation. Um, where do you see this balance? How can Turkey balance these relations? Uh, what is the role of Turkey in, let's say, the medium term? Where do you see the role of Turkey? That would be my question. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for the questions. Before, <clears throat> before we go on, I would like to check whether we still have Alexei uh, with, with us and Provided he's connected, yes. Uh, Alexei, would you would you like to care to, would you care to to comment on uh, anything that has been said and perhaps the issue of EU and NATO membership going hand in hand in, in parallel? Whether this should be the way to go and what could be the repercussions of the two being possibly separate? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yeah, it's very very interesting this discussion. I learned a lot. Uh, <clears throat> what, what I what I do agree that uh, uh, the real security, external security guarantees that you you can get is just the NATO NATO membership, the Article Five. But I think that the euro has it, it, its own value. Uh, first of all, I, I would say that the primary goal of Europe is uh, to uh, maintain or, or to defend democracy liberal democracy and to uh, preserve the liberal democracy as a attractive model for other countries because looking at the roots of the today's war uh, one person in in for the kremlin or wherever he is in a bunker can decide uh, destiny of the whole continent and Belarus to the same extent. I think the real problem there is the way of governance. So that's something that we, we have to do in our, or you have to do uh, in, in your, or better do in your neighborhood. Uh, the, Euro, the, the real strength of Europe is its economic, uh, again, its uh, attractive model and uh, what really needed is a political commitment and uh, to set clear objectives. And these clear objectives, either regarding developing democracy or promoting democracy or uh, its security strategy, should be should be supported, but by all sorts of means. Of means, and no competition with NATO or the United States is really needed in the European continent. Uh, and finally, uh, since our time is running, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone and all of you for being with Ukraine. This is crucial. This is very important for us. Thank you very much. No, th thank you. I, I, I believe we, we all understand that uh, you are fighting the war uh, for us as well. Uh, and uh, I'm personally very glad that the Czech government is showing the, the kind of support uh, it, it, it does. Um, so thank you, thank you again. Let's move to, to Christine. Now you're getting a lot of questions. Uh, <laughs> thanks for taking it. Yeah, well, um, seems I provoked people to think, so that's always a good, good thing and really great questions. Thank you all. Um, to Jim Claus first, um, 
Just a quick note on, on the prospect of Trump coming back to power or somebody like Trump. Uh, I didn't mention it so far in my speech, but of course, in the Baltics, uh, we are very much aware of this possibility. But once again, the answer is then, let's strengthen European capabilities and make us more prepared for that day. But the answer to that uh, possibility is not to say that we have to try to become autonomous as soon as possible. No, we, we keep the US commitment as long as possible, as strong as possible. But if the day comes when this option is no longer there, then we need to be as strong as possible as Europeans, and that's also what we need to work on now. And uh, of course, the EU provides many tools actually to, to do that. Uh, so it has a role to play. Um, but then uh, this more tricky question of what does it mean when I say that uh, a policy of restraint vis-a-vis -vis Russia has not uh, served European security and stability? And how far should we go now? Well, um, primarily, I mean, what, what uh, I think is important now is, is um, to strengthen uh, defense of NATO, you know, stronger NATO presence in the eastern flank countries uh, to, to make sure that it's really a credible defense and deterrence. And, and then also very clear, strong support to, to uh, uh, defense of Ukraine. It's a different uh, story because it's not a NATO member, but uh, of course the defense assistance is crucial for, for Ukraine. But then when it comes to the issue of Crimea, and how far should Ukraine go in, in, uh, uh, when it comes to defending its uh, territorial integrity? Well, we heard from the Ukrainian speaker, I mean, the minimum is now to, to um, regain control over territories that uh, were under Ukrainian control before 24th of February. Because that's the very minimum, because Russia must not achieve anything by this war of aggression. But uh, going beyond that, um, it's rather a question primarily to Ukrainians. And, and when it comes to, to Crimea, um, my guess as, as an analyst is that this issue will remain unresolved for a long, long time. Because we must not, as, as the West, um, legitimize or accept uh, the annexation. But at the same time, we're not likely to try to regain Crimea under Ukraine's control by force. So there will be this unresolved uh, issue, and, and uh, that will be a thorn in the Western-Russian relations. Um, then um, to Frank Schimmelfenig on, on the no-gray zones question and uh, EU enlargement, uh, again, a very, very important question. And um, I agree, ideally, of course, the best uh, solution would be to have NATO and EU both enlarging and uh, providing this clear strategic uh, solution to, to the uh, future position of these countries. But um, we need to be also realistic about uh, the prospect of NATO enlargement. It's not right now in the cards. Uh, and and uh, so the, the kind of acute question now is, is the EU membership perspective. This is something that the EU can move on and, and, and uh, the EU can provide uh, this uh, strategic clarity that it has so far failed to offer to, to Ukraine and, and other Eastern neighbors uh, seeking membership. And that will already be a huge uh, change. And if it comes together with strong military support to Ukraine, then it's already uh, a completely new game for, for Ukraine and, and really kind of a way to anchor uh, Ukraine to Europe and to send this message to Russia that we do actually see Ukraine as part of the European family and we are ready to, to do a lot of things to, to kind of uh, support that goal. And then finally, there was the question on uh, Diplomacy with uh, Russia. Yes, there is this clear difference between uh, the French and German, uh, and then on the other hand, the 
Estonian views. From my point of view, actually, the problem was never so much that there was too much dialogue or too much talking to, to Putin, but uh, the question was always, what is the substance and what is the aim of these discussions? And, and it, in the past months, and also in the past years, it has often not been very clear what do the French and Germans want to achieve by talking to Putin. And this is what has made uh, the Baltic states and Poland and others uh, suspicious. Um, and, and when we hear statements like, yeah, we need to, to think of a face-saving uh, exit for Putin and, and uh, we need to work for immediate uh, ceasefire, these are not in Ukraine's interest. These are not, in my view, in the interest of European security at large, uh, these kind of uh, suggestions. Um, immediate ceasefire would mean Russia staying in the territories that it has now occupied during the past months. And we see what happens in the territories occupied by Russia. So right now, as long as Ukrainians are willing to continue the fight, we should support them in, in uh, pushing back uh, the aggression and, and regaining the occupied territories. And, and uh, we should not be talking about face saving of a dictator and war criminal. So maybe the moment will come, will come when we need to have some sort of deal with uh, Putin's Russia, but it must not be a kind of going back to normal relations. That's, that's my position, thanks. Thank you for that. If, if I can just follow up with a, with, a, with a quick question, you know, as an analyst, when do you expect that the time for diplomacy will come? Uh, when, when the time for diplomacy comes, provided it's, it's not now when we should enforce it, of course, on, on Ukrainians to, to engage in negotiations. Uh, at the moment, and here I personally quite, quite agree, but analytically speaking, when do you expect, under what conditions and possibly in time, in what time uh, there will be a space opening for some sort of negotiation? Well, the time frame is, is quite impossible to, to predict, but I want to refer again to this goal of uh, uh, getting back uh, under Ukrainian control the territories that were under Ukrainian control before the 24th of February. I think that should be the kind of military goal. And then we have a new situation and maybe that will be a moment to, to, to uh, diplomacy and some sort of ceasefire agreement. But actually the, uh, the decisive uh, question is when Ukrainians say that they are ready for uh, diplomacy and for a ceasefire and for seeking uh, an agreement. <clears throat> Thank you. There was also a question for you, Sanam, so please, the floor is yours now. Um, yeah, there was a question about how long this balancing act can continue, I think, from Paul. Well, I think they will, for the government, they will try to retain this balancing policy for as long as possible um, for two reasons. First, of course, they are highly dependent on Russia for energy, as primarily, but also in other sectors like tourism, right, where they expect a lot of revenue, and especially this summer, they, ex they expect it to be at its peak since they won't be, they're expecting that they won't be going to European countries, etc. Having said that, there is also the other side of the story where they also view Russia as a security threat. Because in the Turkish case, just imagine the geography, right? Imagine uh, Russia winning in the north, right? Turkey would be surrounded by Russia in the Black Sea in the north and also in the south because of Syria. Of course, for Turkey, this is a major issue, major security threat. And on top of that, however unrealistic it might sound, um, Turkey became very uncomfortable when Putin, in his that famous long speech that he made, referred to the 1917 borders in the east, which means Turkey's eastern borders before 
the modus vivendi or agreements with Russia were signed. So that also, you know, opens those, you know, territorial issues into contestation as well. That might seem like a very, very, very sort of long stretched issue to think about since we have more immediate, you know, war in Ukraine and immediate threats in, you know, the Baltics or Moldova or Ukraine, etc. But, but still, you know, it, it's, it just makes any government very uncomfortable when you hear those things. So that's, that's, that's that. Now, of course, what happens if the opposition wins? Hmm? Now, if the, op the opposition has been very silent on the war and on all this evolving security debates, and the reason for that is because they know that if they're more vocal, then the government or, and also some circles in the left will brand them immediately as super pro-NATO and that might lose them votes because looking too pro-NATO equals being very pro-American equals losing some votes and they cannot afford to lose any votes before the elections. They're trying very hard to keep a delicate coalition of different political parties together to fight Erdogan. So, so that's why they're mute on this. But having said that, if they can win, and I think they have a pretty good chance as it stands if things go okay, and if they manage to win, then in my opinion, uh, they will try to keep that balance, but it will be a less fragile balance. In the sense that, because the op Turkey has to make a choice, in my opinion, right? Whether is it going to stay in the Western security architecture or whether it will stay out. And from a rational point of view, I don't think it has the luxury to stay out, given the, the, the factors that I've mentioned. So I think the opposition would choose to be in, and also, there is another security threat, a political one, that the opposition feels, and that is the fact that Russia and Putin is always happy with an autocratic government in Turkey. They do not want the government to lose because they know how to play the game with autocrats, you know, with money, and I mean, and it's been discussed here, even in the context of EU member states, they knew how to play the game with Germany and former leaders, etc. And they know that they can make that very easy when they're dealing with an autocratic government, where with the leader, you know, Putin or anybody else like him can establish a personal relationship. That would no longer be the case. And the opposition, if they restore democracy, and that's why they commit to do, and bring the rule of law, etc., it would be, make, make that harder for Russia to assert, exert that influence, and the opposition wouldn't want that as well because that would not work in their favor. So there would be that political dynamic as well as the security fear that in my opinion would keep Turkey in a more solid, still more balanced, uh, given of course the economic problems and woos, even if the opposition comes, they won't go away in day one, they will take a while to re rebuild the country, right? with stop the institutional erosion, rebuild the institutions, rebuild the economy. I mean, the extent to which Turkey's governance system has been eroding is unimaginable, right? So they'll have a lot to do. Um, and in doing that, I think they're going to need European and Western assistance as well. And that also needs to be said. So in my opinion, uh, that, would, uh, that, that might uh, make the balance and Turkey standing in, in the West more solid on that choice easier, but we'll have to wait and see if that happens. If the government wins, then I always fear that at some point they might just withdraw. I mean, that, I know this sounds extremely absurd maybe, but there is always that possibility that they might, at some point that they might choose, also given the rising anti-Westernism and this anti-Americanism, and depending on, on how the domestic situation goes, you know, they might not be able to retain that balance and feel like they will need to make a choice where they might not opt for the Western institution. So in my opinion, it should not be taken for granted that Erdogan will remain in, in case he wins. All right, and on that note, and uh, uh, Loretta <coughs> ringing in the background, let me wrap this up. Uh, by thanking our excellent speakers, Christy Reichs and um, Aydin Disgit, uh, Oleksii Melnik, who joined us uh, from afar, and Trudek Parks, uh, who's uh, um, been here with us until, until quite recently. So thank you all, thank you all for taking part. <laughs>